On this gloomy day in Lagos, Nigeria, the infamous Special Anti-Kidnapping Squad, aka SACS, has turned the city into a giant parking lot, stopping every passing vehicle. Suddenly, a van packed with mercenaries led by the intimidating Angelo rolls in, causing pure mayhem. SACS and the police take cover as bullets dance through the air. Their target is the husband of Professor Stella Craig, the Director General of Nigeria's Oil and Energy Corporation, and also the anti-corruption crusader. He's inside his bulletproof SUV with his baby, a babysitter, and a cop at the wheel. Angelo realizes he can't break into the car, so he comes up with a new plan. He splashes gasoline on the SUV and waves a threatening lighter at the man. After a tense moment, Mr. Craig gives in and steps out of the vehicle. Just then, two policemen intervene and start shooting at the mercenaries, but sadly, they're quickly silenced by a sax trader named Abiyomi. The babysitter desperately tries to escape with the baby, but this guy with dreads shoots her like it's nothing. Although Angelo didn't plan to take the baby, Mr. Dreadlocks recklessly does it anyway. However, just as he's about to jump into the car, sax reinforcements arrive and start blasting at him. He gets slammed to the ground by a car blowing up, miraculously unscathed, while Angelo and his gang run away in fear. The dreadlocked guy is nabbed and taken into custody, but somehow Abayomi pulls strings to get him released from his holding cell later on. Elsewhere in the city, we meet Paul and Damilola Edema, a father and son who are super close despite their different religious beliefs. Paul is excitedly looking forward to his son joining him at the church where he's going to preach that night. But Damilola is adamantly against it, saying he's got no faith in God at all. This is 2020. Nobody really believes in God or his son, Santa Claus. Okay, you might have a point, my friend, but you're going to regret saying that real soon. Believe me, in this movie, Jesus doesn't take that kind of mix-up lightly. Speaking about Jesus, Christmas is just around the corner, guys. And actually, there's a way to give me a little gift with your finger. And no, I'm not talking about your middle finger. Just a simple tap on the like button would be awesome. As they're heading off to their jobs, a radio host talks about the recent kidnapping. They describe the suspect as a tall, dark man with dreadlocks. Turns out they were given the wrong information, stating that the suspect has escaped. Later, a journalist named Victoria walks into a busy editorial office. Her editor, Judith, drops the bummer that her report on a journalist's death can't be published because there's not enough evidence. Turns out the report Victoria's working on is about her own mom. In the next scene, Angelo contacts Professor Craig and puts her in a tough spot by making her choose between saving her child or her husband. Overwhelmed, she struggles for words but ends up begging for her baby's life. Shockingly, Angelo goes against it and pulls the trigger. Baby's cries cut off, triggering the dad's heart-wrenching cries and the mom's sobs on the phone. After completely breaking the woman, Angelo tells her that if she wants to see her husband alive, she has to do exactly what he says which means resigning from her position at NEOC. She's been fighting corruption for a long time, and now her quitting is spreading like wildfire in the streets, making people really mad. However, there's one person who's actually happy about it, the powerful General Issa, the leader of a private army who orchestrated the kidnapping. He's thrilled to see his plan went down smoothly, and he proudly announces his son as the new general director of NEOC. Meanwhile, Damalola's heading to the church to cheer up his dad, but things take an unexpected turn when his cab gets stopped by the SACS members. Turns out, they're on the lookout for a suspect who matches the description of the kidnapper. Tall, dark, and with dreadlocks. Unfortunately, Damalola is a perfect match. The scared cab driver takes off, leaving Damalola in the hands of Abiyomi and other officers who start verbally and physically abusing him. No matter how hard he tries to prove his innocence, they just ignore him. Officer Abiyomi takes his picture and sends it to his superior, Deputy Commissioner, who's standing with the real kidnapper and also Angelo, waiting for confirmation. Angelo gives a nod, and they push Damilola to the side of the beach at gunpoint. Despite his desperate pleas, Abiyomi heartlessly opens fire. And just like that, corruption causes the death of an innocent, leaving him lying in a pool of his own blood, all so that the guilty could escape justice. While Paul is passionately preaching about God's forgiveness for past mistakes, he gets interrupted by the cab driver. He can't believe his eyes as he leans over his son's lifeless body. The authorities show no compassion and quickly take the body away, not allowing him to mourn properly. Days pass and Paul remains immersed in sorrow for the loss of his beloved son. The Sacks told the media that Damilola was the real kidnapper and was killed in a gunfight. Hearing this fills Paul with an overwhelming rage, as he knows his son is innocent. He goes to the morgue to get his son's body, but the staff there blames Paul for having a criminal kid and refuses to release the body until the investigation is complete. Outside, Victoria introduces herself to Paul. She tells him that based on her investigation from the cab driver, Damilola was innocent and she's willing to help him. However, for some unknown reason, Paul brushes off the whole thing, thinking that nothing can bring back his son. All he wants now is to give his son a proper burial. Later, during a conversation with an old friend, 
he contemplates his son's death as a punishment from God for his past terrible sins. Nevertheless, he cannot accept that his son is being accused of being a criminal. He heads to the police station to check on his son's case, but instead, two officers ignore him and get into an argument over food. Things escalate when one of them tries to push him. He quickly slams the officer's head on the table and pins the other one against the locker. Meanwhile, Victoria arrives at the police station to gather info about Damalola's case from one of her contacts. However, her attention is diverted when she sees Paul being escorted away by a bunch of officers. She manages to meet him in his cell and assures him that she'll arrange for his release on bail. Surprisingly, Paul simply asks her to just leave him alone. As a result, Victoria leaves, carefully passing by the other inmates before they can cause a community strike for humble recaps. After the officers beat Paul up pretty bad, they let him go the next morning without any bail. Victoria is waiting for him at his house, but she's shocked when she sees his messed up face. While the old man takes care of his injuries, we can see a tattoo on his wrist that is a sign of his shady past. Victoria shows him a copy of the police report and finds it completely untrue. She truly believes that they framed Damalola. Although Paul understands where she's coming from, he's concerned about her safety and suggests leaving it up to God for payback. But, turns out, that's not really what he wants to do. He opens an old suitcase filled with his military stuff, showing his past involvement in the army. Then he makes a few phone calls, setting off a chain of events beneath the city's surface. With the help of the police report, elderly folks, and even a kid, he successfully tracks down his son's killer. He finds Abayomi in a nightclub and swiftly knocks him out cold before he can say a word. The officer wakes up to find himself strapped to a table with his legs wide open. His co-workers are also there, tied up and sitting on the floor making muffled sounds. Paul switches on a circular saw and starts moving it towards the killer's groin. They're all shaking like leaves on a tree, and eventually the killer starts speaking out of fear when Paul asks who among them took his son's life. The next morning, they are found strapped to a pole in the streets. Since Paul's not around, Victoria sneaks inside his house. She spots his little evidence board and swipes the memory card from the camera sitting on the table. Wasting no time, she takes it straight to Judith. The card contains a video of Paul interrogating Damalola's murderer, who confesses that the real kidnapper was the son of a rich politician, and that was why they had to swap him with Damalola. Out of nowhere, Judith smashes the memory card, bringing up Victoria's mom who was murdered for uncovering the activities of dangerous people and worrying the same could happen to Victoria. But after she leaves the office in despair, it becomes evident that Judith is not standing by her side. She calls the deputy commissioner and tells him that she just destroyed the interrogation tape of one of his boys. The deputy commissioner and Abayomi quickly find Angelo, and they all meet with Senator Depot, whose son was the real kidnapper. He's shocked to find out that the person they scapegoated was actually Paul's son. Depot shares a bit about the old man's history to make clear how dangerous he is. 23 assassinations, 113 domestic ops, and 8 coups since 1984. Worried about his son's safety, Dippo urgently implores Angelo to take swift action on the situation. Later on, Angelo takes out Officer Abiyomi with a single shot to the head, telling the DC to frame Paul for the murder and convincing his commissioner to make him a national security problem. Soon, it becomes clear that Angelo, despite his promise to Professor Craig, also killed her husband. The man's body is found alongside his baby in the mud, and Victoria hears about it right away. Paul arrives to get his memory card back, but Victoria tells him her editor trashed it. Instead, she takes him to meet Professor Craig, whom she believes holds valuable information about the true culprits behind the abduction and murder of Paul's son. Feeling down and isolated, Mrs. Craig hands over the file on the oil blocks to Paul, saying that the threats against her began when she started working on them. Then she turns to Victoria and asks her to carry on with the investigation. She doesn't want the sacrifices she made in the battle against corruption to be for nothing. Victoria quickly begins exploring the file and stumbles upon this shady company called Oil Patriot, whose ownership is listed as confidential. When Paul hears that name, it's like an instant threat alert, and he grabs his suitcase to leave his house. To make matters worse, Victoria shows him the news, where the police commissioner tags Paul as a wanted criminal for killing a sax officer. Meanwhile, Paul hears sneaky footsteps. A gang of mercenaries is trying to crash his house. Quick thinking, he hustles Victoria into his secret room, kills the lights, and catches these goons off guard. Two inside, a bunch outside. But here's what's interesting. He plays it cool and doesn't kill anyone, just gives them a good knock on the head. Meanwhile, Victoria stumbles on pics of herself at different ages in the secret room, sparking suspicions about Paul and his true identity. Right as Paul thinks he's handled all the bad guys, Angelo walks in. He pulls a gun on Paul, throwing shade about his newfound religiosity, but Victoria's shaky voice from the room throws him off his game, giving Paul the chance to flip the script. Their conversation reveals they both served under General Issa at some point. Angelo tags Paul as the general's favorite weapon, 
and the latter sniffs out that Angelo's here to kill him on Senator Depot's orders. All he wants is a confession video of Angelo Depot and his son admitting to killing Damilola, but Angelo says that General will never accept such a thing. So Paul ties up him and his crew in the house, leaving them behind as he leaves with Victoria. He heads straight to his old friend and asks for assistance. Together, they make their way to General Issa's presence. Paul pays his respects to the general with a leg salute, while his friend keeps a watchful eye with a rifle to avoid any mistakes. The general tries to resolve the situation by offering a million bucks, but Paul's not in it for the cash. He only wants his son's body and the confession mentioned earlier. The general blames the police commissioner for the holdup on the body and says that he cannot do anything about the second request. Faced with this roadblock, Paul decides it's time to take matters into his own hands. He declares that he'll personally grab Depot and his son. After the general gives Senator Depot a couple of slaps, he decides to bring in a top-notch assassin for a major cleanup, or as he likes to call it, a fumigation. First off, the assassin heads straight to the sax crew involved in Damilola's murder and takes care of business, leaving behind a scene that only a dad could orchestrate. When the commissioner arrives at the crime scene, she's steaming mad and tags Paul as the number one public enemy. On the other hand, Victoria drops by a church to see Father Omotosho, the guy who's been like a father to her since childhood. After she spotted her own pics at Paul's house, she started second-guessing her history. As a result, she takes some sneaky snapshots of the church's Financial Matters journal. Later, Paul's friend gives him the lowdown on where to find their old comrade Richard, aka Big Daddy, who's got a personal bone to pick with the general. Paul heads over to the spot, and he runs into this lady who is standing in front of her shop. At first, she's all about denying any connection to Big Daddy. But when she sees how persistent he is, she invites him in. However, there's this guy who spots Paul, grabs his phone, and dials it in to rat him out. Later, in a secret cave beneath the shop, we find out that Big Daddy is, in fact, the lady. Richard, her husband, met his end at General Issa's hands when he tried to desert his army. She's boiling with rage, eager to settle the score with the general, but she lacks the power to confront him. She goes on to say that if it had not been for handing over a mysterious book known as the Black Book to the general, Paul would have been killed as well. Paul claims he can take all of Issa's power, but only with her assistance. Here, police sirens and gunshots signal the arrival of the cops and Issa's hired assassin. Their conversation is left unfinished, and Paul manages to escape successfully. Paul then proceeds to visit another woman, the police commissioner. Sneaking into her house, he explains that killing the Sachs officers wasn't on his to-do list, pointing out that if he wanted to kill them, he wouldn't have left them on the street in the first place. After explaining the whole truth about what happened to Damalola, he requests that she give him his son's body and guarantee Victoria's safety. This way, he can hand over the real criminals to the police. The next day, the commissioner grills the DC about the funky details in his report on Damalola's murder. For instance, their report says the kid had a weapon, but there's zero proof of it in the inventory. The commissioner is almost certain about Damalola's innocence, but before the DC can even talk, he gets a headshot from the assassin in the nearby building. Just as Mr. Hitman gears up to leave, he's wiped off the board by one of Big Daddy's female soldiers. Victoria goes back to her dad-like figure to dig into her past, but this time, she also sees Paul in the church. The answer to her curiosity is nothing but the truth, so Paul shares his own story with her, a young soldier trained by the general for tough missions. But the general somehow got involved in the drug business, making big bucks on the sly with Senator Depot. Victoria's mom and other journalists were exposing Senator Depot's drug connections, making the general order a fumigation. Non-cooperators? Marked for elimination. Tragically, Victoria's mom was also on that list. One night, as she's at her table having a photo frame saying, silence is the enemy, she gets shot in the head. Surprisingly, the killer is none other than Paul. However, when he sees little Victoria, he can't pull the trigger, so he decides to take her to Omoto Show and cover all her expenses for upbringing. Back in present, Victoria's shocked as she sees her mom's killer standing right in front of her, and she heads out, tears flowing. Outside, Angelo and his mercenaries seize Victoria, going all out and even attacking the church to kill Paul. Father Omotosho takes a hit and gets killed, but Paul steps up and takes down many of the assailants. Angelo grabs Victoria and makes a getaway. Then, the general gives Paul an ultimatum. Surrender in 24 hours or watch the girl get killed. Enter Big Daddy, offering help but curious about Paul's plan. Paul begins telling the rest of his story. The general wanted him dead because he didn't kill little Victoria. But fortunately, he had an ace up his sleeve, the Black Book. It had info on all of the general and Dippo's drug deals. By handing it over, he saved both himself and Victoria. Now, he tells Big Daddy that he found out the book still exists using his old connections. His plan? Retrieve it and take away all the general's power. 
Paul teams up with his old buddy Tanko and Big Daddy to attack the General's Farm, where they're holding the Black Book and Victoria. Tanko sets off some explosions in the city to divert the attention of the cops. Paul surrenders to the General while Big Daddy's female squad, posing as farmhands, drugs the guards and takes control. The General plays a sick game, forcing Victoria to shoot Paul. Yet things take a turn when Paul informs him that the situation is out of his hands. Angelo tries reaching the farm guards, but no one picks up. The General attempts to seek police help, but they say they're tied up with a city explosion. However, some police vehicles roll into the area. Meanwhile, Big Daddy's squad breaks into the General's vault, finds the safe, and grabs another crucial document. On the way back, Big Daddy and two goons cruising in a cargo van run into the cops and Angelo. Chaos starts with Big Daddy's order to blow up a bomb. A chase takes place and they end up in an old garage. The ladies hop out of the van and Angelo digs through it, hoping to find the safe. But something else catches his attention. The other thing they took from the vault, a video of the general's soldiers taking out four Nigerian army guys, all to protect the general's shady drilling ops. They've already sent that video to the army. Now all the cops ditch Angelo, proving they were also part of the plan. Here, the women of Big Daddy's squad pop out of their hiding place, guns drawn, encircling Angelo and making him surrender. While the general tries to order Paul's execution, his own men begin mumbling words with Paul instead of obeying the order. A nod from Paul, and they ditch the fuming general too. Big mistake messing with a coup plotter, huh? Meanwhile, the safe makes it across a lake unharmed. Now that the general is on the losing side, he's desperate to negotiate. He warns Paul that if the safe's info gets out, the whole country will go haywire. Boasting power, he claims he'll never face a civilian court. In response, Paul drops a bombshell, saying, it's gonna be a military court for killing four soldiers. Infuriated, the general faces the same solution he had suggested to Paul in the past, a gun on the table, urged to kill himself. After putting the gun up to his temple, he turns it towards Paul and pulls the trigger, only to find the gun empty. Seeing this, Paul leaves the general while calling him a coward. Shortly after, army officers arrive to take the disgraced general away. In the aftermath, Paul delivers justice to Angelo right in front of the mother and wife of his victims. He also writes a letter to Victoria, urging her to open the safe and read the black book. In a shocking twist, he reveals Judith as the one who betrayed her mother, in addition to betraying Victoria herself. With the black book in hand, Victoria ensures Depot's swift arrest. And finally, Paul gives his son a proper farewell by burying him. By the way, I'm a bit fuzzy on what went down with Depot's son. Well, hope you liked my attempt to convince you I'm a movie genius here. Thanks a bunch for tuning in.